final panel, uh, a topic that's very close to our hearts here at the Council. Uh, if I can just quickly give you a summary. We had, in 2019, kicked off a new initiative at the ASEAN Secretariat Digital Health Summit with an ambition to discover more creative financing mechanisms to achieve our dream for universal healthcare coverage in this region. Now, the report was presented in 2020, last year, to ASEAN Ministries, and now, this year, in 2021, the Council's Sustainable Healthcare Financing Concept is officially a World Economic Forum program. Now, in this session, the Council will share the latest findings from the research and speak to key leaders in this area about how to attain sustainable healthcare financing for ASEAN and around the world. So, already on stage, thank you, panelists. Uh, we have uh, uh, Dr. Su, Dr. Hak Hong Su, Regional, health of health, uh, Regional Head of Health for Asia generally, and moderator Chris Hardesty, Director of Healthcare and Life Sciences at KPMG. And joining us online is Dr. Eduardo Banzon, a Principal uh, Health Specialist of the Southeast Asia Regional Department at the Asian Development Bank from Europe. Dr. Suzanne Andrea, uh, Head of Health and Healthcare Industry at the World Econo Economic Forum, and Frank Corodin, Head of Global Health Partnerships and Alliances at Sanofi. Speakers, Chris, anytime you're ready. Mic check, hello, hello. Okay, everyone, as was said, this is the final panel. I will make an agreement with you, okay? I will end this thing pretty much close to time and get us out of here if you guys agree to participate show a bit of liveliness, okay? And I'll ask the panelists, just keep the introductory comments brief, and I, I say let's just get into a discussion, right? Everyone okay with that? I'm a strong seconder. <laughs> yes. Otherwise, I can go and keep everyone really late. See, it's like, a, it's like a teacher penalty here, you know? So that's the agreement we have. We've come full circle today. I said at the very beginning of the day, this topic of sustainable health system design and financing, I think you heard a little bit about how that was birthed under the uh, EU ASEAN Business Council a couple of years ago. It became a very hot topic for us in 2020. We probably did 20 or 30 some odd government briefings because as budgets were getting tight, you know, of course, there still is a forward looking kind of view on health system design, sustainable development goals. And so this idea of how we can uh, really just, just kind of reinvent the way our health systems are designed was, was a big topic. Um, I also noticed from the business sentiment survey in terms of the private sector, there's a really keenness to be involved in re the recovery from an economic perspective. And so I'm pleased to say this topic will help you because the current design of health systems in the region is very antiquated. It's based on models from nearly 100 years ago. And if you want proof that it's not really working, the out-of-pocket expenditures on healthcare are still basically double what is the target. So we're not really developing socioeconomically through healthcare as would be desired. And in another study by KPMG, we found that if governments were to spend resources in the most efficient way possible on health systems, they could do that at 30% of current expenditure levels just because of the amount of kind of wastage that goes on, right? So there's an opportunity here for private sector to help with the efficiency and help design a new model. And as was said, this is now officially a recognized World Economic Forum project and the report will be out uh, in October. And so we went around the region virtually last year and had co-creation sessions with different government stakeholders, not just in Southeast Asia, but wider Asia Pacific. And uh, we focused on three primary disease pathways. So immunization, diabetes management, and also rare diseases. So each one kind of has their own nuance here in terms of where we're going with healthcare, but it, it was very interesting. And so we've now uh, called this basically UHC 2.0. So getting out of the models from 100 years ago and designing something more fit for purpose for this part of the world, okay? So that's a little bit of the context there. What I'm gonna do, I'm just gonna introduce each panelist briefly. You've heard their title, so I'll give you a different characteristic about them. I was gonna ask each panelist a question and kind of you know get into that, but what I'll ask each panelist is really just maybe keep your introductory comments brief. And I've already gained agreement from the audience here that they've got their questions and they're gonna engage with me, all right? Uh, first, I will call on Suzanne. And so again, you've heard everyone's title, so I'm gonna give you a unique characteristic about each person and show you how outclassed I am here on the stage, okay? We've got PhD number one from Suzanne in immunology and a biochemist by training. So this will be a panel full of PhDs and doctors. I'll, I'll share it like that. Uh, maybe Suzanne, yeah, over to you if you wanna explain more about your role and any introductory comments. 
Sure, thanks a lot. It's a pleasure to be here, everybody. Um, I'm head of health and healthcare industry at the forum and um, basically engaging with our um, business partners across the entire healthcare value chain. So from pharma, uh, medtech, uh, insurers and, uh, and providers. And um, in terms of looking at healthcare financing, especially in the Asian region, uh, there's just two key messages that I'd like to uh, start with, and then we can dive deeper in, in the discussion. The first one is we know that with the rising costs, um, healthcare systems become increasingly unsustainable. And particularly we see in the Asian region, um, a high burden through out of pocket expenditure, um, a gap in coverage of the vulnerable populations, but also some ineffective spend and um, not always the highest quality of care that we could um, envision. So basically governments are trying to address that. And my first key message is governments cannot and should not aim to do this alone. The private sector is increasingly ready, able and willing to join in as a partner. So not only as a provider of um, medication or uh, materials, but really as a strategic partner in addressing equitable access, access to, to health and healthcare. And uh, public-private collaborations, when they're set up in the right way and with the right framework and um, aligned um, incentives, can have um, a significant impact on, on equitable access to care. And the second key message I want to um, leave you with at the beginning is um, COVID has shown, uh, has put a spotlight on the vulnerability of our health systems. And we have clearly seen uh, through COVID-19 that a health challenge is not only a health challenge, it's an economic challenge. It's a challenge for the entire population on, on poverty, on wealth, on um, employment, on travel, on supply chain, etc. So the solution to health should also be across um, um, cross industry and cross uh, theme um, solution, where it's not only the health minister, but it's the economic, the finance, the agriculture, the education, all of these ministries, but also all of these industry sectors need to come together to develop a solution. And we now have a window of opportunity with this topic being such a high priority topic for many governments and regions to really address this and build a more sustainable and resilient healthcare system. And with that, I'll hand back to you, Chris. Thank you. Thanks, Suzanne. Get your questions ready, guys. Okay, next I'll call in Eduardo from uh, the ADB. And uh, Eduardo is uh, pri previously an advisor to the WHO, has uh, health financing education through the London School of Economics, and is a medical doctor. So as I said, quite outclassed here myself. But uh, Eduardo, any initial comments about yourself? Ah, sorry, um, so Chris. So uh, I said I'm, uh, okay. I have been working in helping countries move, uh, move towards developing member uh, countries move towards universal health coverage and work that I have done all across Asia. So clearly, in order for that to happen, you need one country to put more money in And doing that would mean more budget, more earmarked money, whether you talk about health insurance funds, and the private sector participating in two critical ways. One, the willingness to put more money into health, either because they're willing to pay higher employer share of the premium or they will allow uh, private sector health insurance to be part of the uh, fund that government usually manage. The second part is to start looking at health less as a, something where they make lots of money, but something where they do volume with less margin. And in a sense, if we look at what's happening in COVID right now, that's been the storyline. Hospitals willing now to bring in patients at lower margins. Uh, vaccine companies selling their vaccines at a lower margin than they usually have because they're they're, they, they see the value. In a sense, they're saying, okay, we're willing to do volume. We lower the, the margins. Of course, the government commitment is that there's money to pay for that. Now, if this thing, which is, is not unique, it's not the first time, it has happened before, is actually how health systems would evolve then UHC is something that will become sustainable in here in Asia. Over to you, Chris. Super, Eduardo, thank you. Let me call in my colleague on the stage here, uh, Ha Kong with Generali, and if I'm not mistaken, PhD in economics and insurance. So you keep rounding us out here with the credentials. Over to you for your comments. Thank you very much, Chris. Hi, uh, good evening, everyone. Hi, I'm Dr. Sue. 
um, so I'm the, the head of uh, health uh, for Asia, for Generali Asia. Uh, Generali is, is an Italian uh, insurance company uh, that has been around for 190 years. So basically my role is really a responsible for the strategic development and also making uh, health uh, proposition and the service offering to all our client base and the users uh, in Asia across uh, eight countries in Asia. And we have the 12 business unit here. My responsibility is on the health and accidents business. Uh, as Chris said, uh, I'm PhD in insurance and econometrics. Uh, my background is actuarial. So looking after all the pricing and the product offering to make the best uh, customer value proposition. Thank you very much. Thank you, super. Okay, and last but not least, we have Frank uh, dialing in from Paris, Sanofi. Frank, you've been involved in the Sustainable Health System Design Program for several years now. You were based in Asia for, I believe, over a decade, so got a soft spot in your heart for this particular region. And if I'm not mistaken, you're a PhD in biokinetics and a pharmacist by training. So, Frank, over to you. Yeah, thank you, Chris. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Very pleased to be with you, even though only from Paris, but uh, very pleased to be part of this panel on this uh, what is uh, a topic very close to my heart, uh, the, the, how to ensure the sustainability of our health system. And um, just as an introduction, I think when one talk about uh, sustainability, there is definitely an element of timing, uh, duration. And that's also one of the issues we need to, to contemplate when talking about that. It's how can we ensure that the health system of tomorrow will be of the same quality, of the same quantity, if I may use the term, uh, for the future generation. I've got three kids uh, myself. They're aged 14, 12, and 10. And I, I really want to strive to make sure that they will be able to benefit uh, of the innovation that our industry will bring uh, to the population. But when we talk about health system financing or health system sustainability, I think there are an element of planning, there are elements of dialogue and conversation that was uh, nicely presented by, uh, by Suzanne earlier in the panel. And one key element to kickstart the conversation for me is how can we shift the conversation from health perceived as a cost versus health as an investment for future return and therefore as a key contributor to the uh, economic growth of countries. And that is possibly one of the uh, positive effects of COVID, surprisingly, is that it has suddenly brought health at the forefront of both political and economical discussion uh, with governments and uh, among uh, economies. And that's a unique opportunity for us today to grab this, to cite this opportunity to make sure that health will continue to remain a, a key topic in the agendas of governments so that they keep investing in health. Back to you, Chris. Great, so now you've gotten to meet everyone and I'd say let's have a bit of a discussion. I will say when I said earlier, commitment, share this together, I did see a few people leave, so I guess they, that uh, scared them a little bit. But I'd say let's take about 20 minutes, okay? We'll get this thing back on track. I'll alternate between those in the room and if anyone virtually there wants to ask a question, please do. I'd just say, Introduce yourself, let's, let's make this a bit uh, engaging. If you can say who your question is directed to, for starters, I think that will help a little bit. Uh, and it's okay if you want to make a comment from your own work based on what you've heard these guys say, or if you do have a question, I mean, I think let's just open it up a little bit. So who's gonna help us? Who wants to go first? Somebody please. Come on guys, nobody? Thank you, thank you, Sarah. Please, can we get a mic? Uh... Thanks, thanks everyone so much for uh, being on today and thanks Chris for moderating. Um, I guess, you know, as, as you mentioned, uh, Frank, this COVID time has expanded a lot of the conversations between 
health ministries and finance ministries and linking, uh, you know, health and, and economy. And I'm just curious, broadly, do you think that there is kind of a limited runway on the time that we have to really have those conversations? Or do you think that it is kind of here to stay and now uh, there's kind of a more permanent sense of this linkage between the two? And you mind just uh, quickly introducing yourself, saying where you're from? Yeah. Sure, uh, Sarah Lessing from US ASEAN Business Council. Cool. So what do you guys think? Timeline, I mean, obviously there's a lot of stuff. By 2030, we hear all this, right? But things are, it's a totally new world now. So who wants to, who wants to start there? What do you guys think? Maybe, maybe I start off uh, first. Uh, in ASEAN, I think the, all ASEAN countries have, have a mission to really become, uh, in terms of national health scheme, to be very adequate you know, uh, in 10 years' time, 2030. But when we look at the index of national health scheme, uh, the readiness and the adequacy is, is far behind. I think a lot of catch-up still need to be done, right? So the question is really relevant to how sustainable of the current whatever level of national health scheme that is available and how the private sector can really complement towards that. That leads back to exactly the, the, the topic of, of this panel is the sustainability of uh, healthcare financing. I think in, in terms of this, uh, we, we will have to really see, to make the journey, everyone uh, really have to take a responsibility. And uh, private insurance industry, uh, from the perspective, uh, we, we work very closely with the public health scheme. I think a lot of uh, the product, the benefit, is really meant to provide a, a, a baseline of a protection resilience. So in order to really make uh, uh, things uh, meaningful to the customer, particularly on those segments that really need the protection gap protection. And we all know the, the health protection gap in, in Asia particularly is uh, according to a survey of, I think, Swiss Re, was about 1.8 trillion US dollars. I think with this pandemic, I think it's much widening the gap. So I, I think the key is really not only the public policy, that really have to work together, but individually, as an uh, individual, uh, we have to take uh, accountability on our own health being. So um, in terms of how private insurance can really help in this regard is that, I think that we play a role to really put up a, a good product offering so that uh, a base layer of protection in terms of hospitalization and also the cost of sickness is very well covered off. But then uh, more importantly, we have to change the mindset of how people treating and, and take a responsibility on their own health uh, uh, being, uh, meaning that if we could uh, make them uh, people more health conscious, according to our study internally within generally, I think uh, that will make uh, this, uh, them to really more prone towards uh, needing a protection because the more health conscious people, they're more likely to see the impact of uh, this uh, protection health gaps uh, when they are impacted by these uh, medical expenses during sickness or things like that. So uh, in this regards, I think to really make uh, the, the step forward, uh, we, we definitely encourage uh, a lot of uh, value add service uh, to really put forward in all the products and also particularly to make up a product offering that's really supplemented to, to a lot of social health scheme to make the, the long runs of the sustainability of the healthcare mm -hmm. financing much more meaningful. So it may not address all your questions, but I think the other panelists uh, would like to chip in as well. Yeah, thanks, Dr. Sue. Certainly we've talked a lot today about activated companies, activated consumers, whether it be healthy aging, prevention, self-care. So it's been a, a very big theme today. I see some of the panelists have their virtual hand raised, so I'm not sure who had their hand up first, but maybe I come to you, Suzanne, started. Sure, yeah, thank you very much. Um, yeah, I, I, I would like to come back to that question of, do we have a window of opportunity or will this you know, be now a long-term change that is lasting? And if you just look back at um, the history of pandemics and epidemics, um, unfortunately, we have to realize that there, there, there is a crisis. This crisis has often, um, despite all the misery it brings, also brought some, some, act, some activity and some energy in, in creating something. But then it's, there is a risk of this fading. 
And so the importance for me is to use that window of opportunity to actually anchor some changes into our health systems and frameworks. And if you look back at the Ebola epidemic, for example, in Western Africa, CEPI, the Coalition of Epidemic Preparedness um, and Innovation, has been created out of that crisis. We leveraged the funding, there was government support, there was support from the pharmaceutical um, uh, businesses, and uh, CEPI was launched at uh, Davos back in 2017 at the annual meeting, and is now a key player in that next pandemic. So um, I would call for action now to use that window of opportunity we have and the focus that we have across uh, the world of, for anchoring a new pandemic preparedness and an improvement in the health system sustainability going forward. And then we can have a lasting change. Thank you. Super. And I think we heard on one of the earlier discussions today that even out of this is the establishment of the first ASEAN-wide CDC, for example. So, uh, yeah, take, taking the opportunity here. Eduardo, how about you? You have your hand up. Yeah. Uh, uh, thanks, Chris. Okay. So, look, if we start looking at every country in the region, you know, what, what essentially the pandemic has basically, you know, the argument that we need more money for health. It's a, it's, it's a one game, you know. And so we have seen government put more money into health. The arguments that we have, you, you know, we used to say, you know, uh, we need more money into health or it would affect the economy if something happens. You know, it's a, it's, a, it's a story that's happening in front of us. So we now have more money for health. And then we have also seen how countries have actually uh, engaged the private sector in very creative ways. Uh, whether in mobilizing them to increase testing, whether they're mo being mobilized to support vaccination programs and all that. So I think this is the opportunity, you know, I, I, rather than focusing in, in, the global, uh, in the global response at the country levels, at the least, the country should make sure, those who are advocating health, that the money that government is putting into health now will not be reduced. You know, so the argument that even after the pandemic, more money, the money should be sustained and retained. And you know, if we look at the numbers, we're seeing doubling of health budget in every country across the region. That should be fought for. That should be protected by people within the country. The engagement with the private sector, where the private sector is willing to lower their costs in order to support government, that should be protected. That should be the way the business should be going. We should start, you know, if, if countries, if the private sector is willing now to sell vaccine at $7 or $6, uh, new vaccines or medicines at a low price, that should now be the way business and that should not be reversed. So for me, that's the opportunity that countries should not waste out of this pandemic. Over to you, Chris. Thanks. And I think probably in the, in the middle there is that engagement between public and private sector, which has, has in many instances been wonderful over the last couple of years. Not always, but... I think that's also been a positive shift. Frank, anything you want to add here before I take another question from this audience that are, are ready? I'm sure you guys have more questions. Frank, anything else? Yeah, no, I, I would definitely echo what uh, Susan mentioned and that uh, we, we have an opportunity to, to, to size and it will depend on how much we'll be able to, to keep the dialogue open, but how to translate this uh, in uh, uh, this investment, this effort that countries are currently doing into structural changes that will allow for this influx of money that's been extraordinary, that's been painful for all economies, but will be sustained. Uh, I appreciate uh, um, your view, uh, Eduardo, on the, uh, the ability for countries to maintain that effort. If we look at the way this money was, uh, was put uh, at the forefront, was always been an uh, extraordinary budget, either from head of state or some other uh, pocket of budget. And I'm glad to hear that you perceive from ADB that that should be sustainable. That's really what we need for health, for the population, for the patient in, in the region and, and worldwide. Uh, we, we need the dialogue and we need to keep that uh, ball rolling um, with all partners involved, from insurers, uh, pharmaceutical companies, uh, governments, to make sure that at the end of the day, patient will keep benefiting from uh, from that uh, effort. Great. Yeah, I mean, the ecosystem of stakeholders that are or could be involved in this space is only getting bigger. So I think a spirit of uh, optimism here from the, from the panel. Okay, so we've got zone one in the lead. I think they've, they've done a good job there. They're on the scoreboard. 
How about zone two? Can I get can I get one question from zone two? I see a lot of people looking down on their phones. Marion, I see you back there. Anybody want to ask anything? Oh, got something? Anybody from zone two? Uh, zone three? Somebody help me out over here? Yes, Elena, thank you. Hello, thank you for this discussion. My name is Eleni uh, Dimokidis. I'm a senior manager at my health lab, Asia Pacific, and I'm, I'm, the, I'm a young global leader at the World Economic Forum, so it, this is a very interesting topic for me to discuss. I wanted to ask you, uh, in, this is for all the panelists, do we have consensus on what are the, the drivers for sustainability? Are we looking just at creating a healthcare system that could have some unanimous values, like creating equity, creating uh, you know, a, a high, the highest quality of services and therapeutics that are accessible and medicines that are accessible to the people? Or are we also looking at the infrastructure itself in different countries? For example, uh, are we looking at how the, the, the hospitals are made in a sustainable way to reduce consumption of energy, to increase the value, and then in this in relevance to the GDP of the country itself? And do you have a mechanism that you're targeting or a particular organization that you think could implement a universal system or a mechanism to introduce a sustainable solution, in particular for the infrastructure itself that could be globally implemented. Thank you. That's true. It's one of those words that has a lot of meanings and is probably overused a little bit sometimes. But anybody want to start there? Go ahead. Let me let me try. Whether it can be globally applicable, that's a very challenging question. Uh, but I think as far as private insurance industry is concerned, we are actually seeing uh, ourselves as a company, uh, we are part of the whole health ecosystem. I think it's a very important thing uh, to really play a part of the role in this ecosystem. Why I said so? There are a lot of things that is impacting the sustainability of the financing, the healthcare financing, namely, is about, you no. Know, um, is the payment mechanism correct or not? I think this is the fundamental issue. Um, we have been uh, using in a lot of countries to use fees for service, uh, you no know, payments uh, method. But I think uh, that's uh, going through a lot of uh, changes here. So uh, for insurance industry, we are really looking at the way how we can improve the payer which is uh, insurance company from certain perspective or household by themselves, out of pocket, whatever. But uh, this uh, payer uh, and also uh, the provider relationship need to be improved. The way to improve it is that we got to change the mindset of a zero sum game. It's either you win or I lose. That is not the case. I think to really uh, make these changes, uh, we will have to really see how we could really work closely with all our provider networks. And that's exactly what the focus and the emphasis as a private insurance company, as, as far as uh, we would try to really, you know, establish certain good provider network that's uh, within our panels uh, where our health insurance uh, members can really access to. I think uh, in order to do so, we have to improve uh, the medically necessity uh, treatment so that we can stir uh, the patient with a correct medical condition to the relevant provider, so that the provider of, uh, that fitting to that need can really perform the necessary things at the least cost possible. I think that is the starting point. And being a, a part of the health ecosystem, I think uh, technology is definitely very important because we are talking about how to really set up a good data infrastructure and uh, a, a uh, important elements of a, a good health ecosystem basically will have a three layers, right? We have a infrastructure, that's the data storage of all the relevant information. If we are talking about a, a patient-centric uh, health ecosystem, that will mean uh, all the data relevant to this uh, patient will be stored and then collectively shared with all the participants or the stakeholder within the health ecosystem. And then the way of how we structure this uh, data, it will be through a very intelligent way 
that will give all this uh, tech data insight into uh, some actionable uh, action. That's the, the behavior of the patient and then link up with all the respective provider. And accordingly, all the respective uh, provider will be able to really act on the most efficient way to really address uh, and, and really uh, touch on all these uh, pain points of, of the patient. So I think that is a starting point you know, that we could really improve the, the sustainability. I will not say it's a globally, but then every part got to do their own you know, duty to really get the ball rolling. And that is a part that uh, at least generally is very, very into this. We want to really deliver our service uh, as a lifetime partner uh, to all the customer and, the, and, and to the society as well. And of course, this is actually a very practical solution because we do see, for example, integration of payer provider networks into accountable care organization styles. So it's not a kind of far off vision. I mean, these, these kinds of things are happening, right? Yeah, uh, especially the storage, right? We, we have been using a lot of AI based uh, you know, uh, portal. And uh, there's a lot of vendor out there. And we can do it in house, so we can leverage on the various vendor. There's a lot of technology where is, uh, you know, even we can really help for a very sim simple you know, symptom tracker. And then they will really look at, ah, so for those are very, very mild condition, actually self-care is the most important and efficient way of really addressing the, this uh, very uh, heavy cost of the financial burden of the medical treatment. Actually, for example, in a lot of countries, for example, in Thailand, you know, a, a, a flu, uh, they, they want to go to hospital. But actually, that is really not a surgery. It's a mindset that it's got to change. So as an insurance company, we, we really need to play this role. We will have to pull up a lot of good portal that support all the consumer to do an informed decision. For those uh, very mild condition, they, they shall drive towards the self-care. There's a self-care library that uh, really perform. If there's a minor condition, Nowadays, with the, you know, uh, this uh, widely used telemedicine, as far as an insurance company can lever leverage that and then put that as a, as a benefit, uh, even you use telemedicine, I think that is a perfect way to go about it. And when it comes to the very heavy medical condition, yes, then it's about how we store it to the most efficient. And I will, I'm saying the, the most efficient, not only from the cost perspective, but it's also from the quality, cost, efficiency uh, 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 aspect as well. Then all these things will gel together to really work together to help the society, you know, from the insurance perspective, from the payer perspective, to make the whole society is a very good way to, be, to live. Yeah. Thank you. Eduardo, I think you have your hand up. Over to you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Chris. You know, look, one of the things, uh, and, and, and it's a great point that was raised, uh, we, COVID has actually affected the global economy so badly that everybody is now doing recovery plans. Uh, everybody's basically saying, look, we need to change the way we have designed a lot of parts of the industry. And, uh, and a, a term that's coming out right now is, well, from ADB, we call it a green recovery. Okay. And in a sense, the health sector should also have that. Okay. Uh, we have seen how the health sector has been affected. We have seen how telemedicine is now part, has become, and I think uh, Jeremy was talking it in the other session, how basically telemedicine has now become part and parcel of how health delivery services is being given. Now, uh, if we want to push it further, uh, the one who asked the question, and, that, and that's probably the challenge to you, what do you want the health sector to do when you start talking about uh, a green recovery of the health sector or green infrastructure in the health sector. Unfortunately, there have been advocates of that uh, globally. I think there has been some documents that have been written, but it's not really mainstream. Okay, they have not really, it has not really been taken on by people in the health sector. Uh, so I think that's part of the challenge. You know, it's like, it's easy to say, Chris said that, you know, everybody talks about it, you know, green infrastructure, green hospitals, all that. But what does it actually mean? And I think if you, the advocates, could work with people like us and we're willing to work with you or, or WEF, you know, we, and we could bring it down into very specific details, what we actually mean 
you know, what are the areas of investment that we should put in? What should we advocate specifically? Not the big words, but very specific advocates. Uh, then that we could actually, in a sense, uh, really, uh, this could be one of the, you know, I, always, I always hate saying this, the benefits of this pandemic, that it actually would trigger uh, a green health sector uh, in the coming decade or so. Over. Thanks, Eduardo. And again, very practical because there are some active discussions happening around, for example, green financing, how that interplays into healthcare, evolving out of a sinful tax kind of mentality and into more of a of a green uh, green financing model too. Frank, what about you? You've got your hand up. You know, I just wanted to give a possibly an industry perspective to the question, which was really uh, really global and challenging. I think one of the aspects I'd like to stress is. Uh, is the search for more efficiencies in the system at all levels. And uh, from, a, from a pharma company, what we care about is, of course, patients. Um, and how can we make sure that patient health and well-being will be one of the key uh, criteria for evaluating the efficiencies or the quality of the delivery of health? And... Uh, what we believe at Sanofi is that prevention should be emphasized in, in health policy. And when I talk about prevention, I'm not only talking about immunization, which, is, which has clearly demonstrated the economic benefits uh, at country level, that the more you invest in prevention, the more you invest in your immunization schedule, and you expand beyond uh, childhood immunization to adolescent and adult and senior citizen with influenza, for instance, then you have uh, immediate to mid and long-term benefit. Uh, I know, Eduardo, you don't like the, the term benefit, but return on investment. And what we would like is more fluid budget at government level. In our corporation, we, we have budget, we manage budget, but when we identify areas where saving can be done, it's to re-inject those, those savings in more investment, be it in research and development or expansion of our geographical footprint or our activities where we believe there will be further uh, return on investment. So this notion of fluidity of budget is something that is still missing uh, at government level, unfortunately, where savings are not re-injected toward health. And that would be what prevention could be, could, could be uh, contributing to. And not only for immunization, but Thinking about non-communicable diseases for diabetes, we, we are clearly uh, investing in diabetes access. We have digital program to help patients suffering from diabetes, but also how to cater for the, the, the caregiver. It's the same with rare diseases. How can we make sure that at the end, patient will benefit of all the economies, all the improvement in the efficiencies? That's what just I wanted to add, uh, Chris. Great. And I think one way to look at it is there's actually plenty of capital and financing available. It's just how it's allocated, right? We talked earlier about the spectrum of prevention that really needs to be uh, unlocked. Suzanne, you want to comment on this one? And then we'll kind of wrap things up for everybody. Oh, you might be muted. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, thank you very much. I'd like to build on the comment that Eduardo um, uh, made on the, um, on the green uh, trans transitioning. And um, I, I, my sense is that there, there's quite some energy and movement being generated now in the run-up to the climate conference COP26 in, in Glasgow later in November, and especially uh, through the Race to Zero initiative from the private sector as well. At the World Economic Forum, we have um, launched um, a climate action platform where we bring in all those private sector partners, a CEO alliance to further scale and accelerate and raise the ambition. And we have uh, a lot of interest also in the health and climate topic where we see the interrelations between climate and health and also impacts already on cl from climate change on, on health today by uh, changing disease patterns, by the if, um, impacts of droughts and flooding and, and things like that. So there, there is some energy, it's not yet enough, but we do see a critical mass of businesses coming on board and really um, committing to a net zero transition and the transformation. So there is, um, there is some momentum 
coming on board. And there's also some real guidelines and best practice standards that are being established um, by, by international organizations and NGOs to help hospitals, providers, and, and others in, in going along that path. So still a long way to go, but there, is, um, there are good starting signs. That's a good point. Thank you. Uh, I think I read something recently that the future of the public health profession is going to be in climate change, essentially. So the more we kind of look left and right and maximize efforts, right, uh, I think is the key. Okay, I promised you guys I, I'd wrap it up, even though you guys didn't ask a lot of questions. That's okay. Thanks for those who did. I'm going to ask each panelist uh, if you could just have one wish, okay, on this topic of sustainable health system design, if it's something near term, if it's something a bit longer term. What is really one thing you would like to see, and including specifically how can kind of public and private sector work together, right? But what is sort of one one wish you would have? Dr. Sue, so you want to start? I think is full trust worthiness across various stakeholders. It is in one word. That will mean uh, we all have to do our part. Uh, particularly consumer, you have to take your own accountability on your health. You look at the, you know, ASEAN's out pocket and the insurance penetration rates of average 3.5%, you can tell how confident is their health perception. They think they are much healthier than they are actually. So in actual fact, in one of the way uh, in uh, that I found uh, more than 60% of smokers think that they are very healthy. So what does it mean? It's a perception that with respect to your own health protection gap is uh, much uh, lower. So I think it's a matter of everyone take its own accountability and think and well prepared for this uh, health protection uh, impact it may cause them. And all this will play a role in to the overall society's uh, sustainability of the healthcare financing system. You remind me of the famous quote, we all have a million wishes, but until we're sick, and then we just have one wish, right? We need to think a little bit more ahead for ourselves, I believe. Suzanne, how about you? What is your, your wish here? Yeah, my, my one wish would be for this um, effort of improving health system resilience to be a true multi-stakeholder effort that we engage governments, the private sector, but also civil society, academia, and the general public. And I think jointly, there is a big opportunity to really have an impactful change right now. Many Thank you. Eduardo, how about yourself? Uh, Chris, I would have wanted to have high needs chickens from Singapore flown to Manila, but I don't think that's what you want, right? Uh -huh. uh, now, well, look, one of the things we probably recognize, the health sector is a very conservative sector. You know, change you know, change is difficult to happen in the health sector. We're all trained to follow the oldest doctor, right? Uh, it's a very hierarchical system. And, 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 and in a sense, what COVID have shown is that there's a lot, lots of changes has happened because of COVID, telemedicine, engagement of the private sector, which a lot of government health officials use to avoid. Now they've been forced in lots of countries. So what my, my wish, uh, or even the discussion of uh, listening to people on uh, green health infrastructure, you know, before you go into a room of health, people that get kicked out. Now people are willing to listen because we have seen now that we need fresh ideas and all that. So that's my wish. That's the, 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 the transformation, you know, in the health sector where it's, where the rigid thinking has is being challenged, and in a sense, new ideas are being accepted uh, in an accelerated manner. Where you know it has, it did happen, but slowly. Uh, I wish that this continue to be accelerated uh, in the next few years, because I think you know we're really seeing an inflection point in the health sector on how, and you know, we, we, probably five years from now, we'll probably have a meeting here all of us laughing about how different the health sector five years from now is to what it is now. Over to you, Chris. Super, thanks, Eduardo. Okay, Frank, bring us home here. What's your, what's your wish? Um, uh, I think one, one should wish a lot when it comes to health. Uh, I think for me, the, 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 there's one question which could possibly summarize is that if anyone unfortunately can afford to die how can we make sure that we can afford to be treated and to be sick 
And that's possibly uh, the, the key question we should have in mind when talking about sustainability of health system. And uh, a possible answer is how can we co-create the system of the future? How can we make sure that what the crisis is bringing in terms of disruption and acceleration, that we, we're gonna size this opportunity, grab it, and impact the system in a, in a structural way so it remains. So it's, it's a vast question, it's an ambitious one, but I think by the contribution of all actors from the industry, the insurer, the uh, multilateral aid, uh, or the platform, I think we, we, we need to keep the momentum uh, and make sure that we will keep talking about this and change uh, deeply uh, for the benefit of patients. Back to you. Thanks, Frank. Yeah, I think one of the pillars of the UHC 2.0 concept is, you know, lowest common denominator sustainable health system, not top of the pyramid health system, but really uh, bringing everybody along all, of, all segments of our population. So I just want to say thanks to the panelists. Thanks to everyone for uh, joining us throughout the day today. I basically heard three things. Let's seize this opportunity where we do have momentum. Let's have a spirit of optimism, as we saw in the sentiment, uh, you know, survey from the EU ASEAN Business Council and just get involved, right? Through the council, other efforts, it's your opportunity to get engaged. So uh, thanks a lot. I'll hand it back to the council for the final segments. Thank you so much, Chris.